Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the National Finance Brokers Day for 2022. My name's Michael Filippo and I'll be your MC today. I think it's actually wonderful that we can hold this event in person after a few disrupted last short few years. Today we've got a jam-packed agenda with a number of decorated speakers who will be talking about an array of relevant financial services topics across finance broking right through to we'll be hearing from a very inspiring speaker, the world's greatest aerial skier of all time late in the day. So across the morning until 12.15, we'll hear from these wonderful speakers, then we'll break for lunch. Okay, so we'll have a buffet lunch just being served outside of these doors. Please do take that opportunity over that hour to be able to network with your wonderful colleagues who are all here today. We'll then come back at 1.15 sharp and we'll hear from the balance of our exemplary speakers before we then finish and close at 4.30 today. Now, from a housekeeping perspective, in the case of an unlikely emergency, please make your way in an orderly fashion through these doors at the back of the room and there are some exit points just throughout the building. For a convenient stop, um, if we've got amenities just outside, close to the lifts for both the men and the women, and throughout the presentations themselves, please can we ask that you switch your phones to silent or off. And for the, for the speakers themselves, we'll give a little bit of flexibility in terms of questions because invariably you may have a few. Some of the speakers will hold some time at the balance of their presentation. So you'll have the opportunity to uh, field any of those questions that you have burning at that time. Now, without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our first speaker to the stage. He has nearly 20 years of experience in senior finance roles, having worked for Commonwealth Bank, Suncorp Group and Capify. He's been plying his craft as a seasoned leader in business development and growth. He's now currently the head of third party relationships for the Simplicity Loans and Advisory Group charged with guiding the strategic direction for the group, as well as delivering on market share via his relationship managers and amplifying the brand through their third party channel, Marketplace Finance. It was in 2012 that he found his passion within the intermediary channel, and that then culminated into the National Finance Brokers Day being born in 2015. This entity itself is, has been built to raise awareness about the mortgage broking industry in the Australian market. He's also very deeply passionate about personal branding, and I think he's a wonderful example, an exemplary example of someone who lives, he lives the creed, boasting an exemplary profile on digital platforms. And on a side note, he follows soccer and the powerhouse club in London, Chelsea Football Club. Please welcome to the stage the founder, Mr. Dino Pacella. I didn't know that Chelsea was coming out, so don't hold that against me. Um, firstly, can I start by wishing everybody a very happy National Finance Brokers Day. As Mick said, this was born in 2015, so this year makes it its seventh year, and it's the first time that we've held an all-day conference followed by a celebratory after party as well. Um, this year's a little bit different, so we've opened it up to make it available to the general consumer because we, we really wanted to tick the space around building the awareness of the broking channel, but we've also opened it up to brokers, finance professionals and lenders as well because it's all about celebrating the wonderful work that brokers do throughout the year as well as celebrating the consumer market. Um, I just wanted to shout out the camera behind, straight, at, straight there if you ever want to look at it and give us a wave. Um, people at home are live streaming or from their offices so we, we won't forget you and hopefully you'll be able to hear us as well and there'll be a special live streaming coming from all the sponsors at lunchtime for the people at home so stay tuned for that. Um, but from my perspective, I would just like to take the time to thank everybody for your attendance today. Thank you to Mick, our MC, for spending the time out of his busy schedule to facilitate today and make sure it goes, brings my vision to practice really. Um, last of all, thank you to all our wonderful speakers in advance. I know they'll do a fantastic job. And finally, for me, without these events and without, oh, sorry, without sponsors, these events become extremely difficult to manage. So as you can see up on the screen, I just want to take a moment to read out the sponsors and I know you can read it yourself, but um, to our platinum partners, Clear Credit Solutions, Loan Market, Marketplace Finance, Latrobe, Fusion Capital, Money Me, QBO, thank you very much. To our gold partners, CAFPA, Lend, Social Broker, Affordable Staff, My State Bank, Early Pay, Nectar Mortgages and Brokers Back Office. Certainly appreciate your support. For our live streaming partner, Capital Bridging Finance, who's bringing the live streaming to everybody at home and at work. 
um, to our official media partner, the MPA, our coffee cart partner, Uptick, Uptick Marketing, so hopefully enjoying the coffee cart and will do throughout the breaks, and to our after-party sponsor for this evening, Property Powerhouse. So can you give, all give our partners a wonderful round of applause? That's it for me. Please enjoy the day and happy NFPD once more. Thank you. Th thank you, Dino, and thank you to the lenders, brokers, and alliance partners and the sponsors. It wouldn't be possible without you. Now, our next session is a very special one being delivered by our keynote speaker for the day, where he'll discuss the ins and outs of investing in today's property market. By way of introduction, please indulge me a little bit, um, as you may not be aware of his biography, I'm sure you are. This gentleman is an Australian entrepreneur who's been innovating for years, challenging the business landscape with disruptive business models that help Australians succeed. He's best known as the founder of Wizard Home Loans, which at the time was the second largest non-bank lender in Australia, which he sold to General Electric in 2004. He's now the executive chairman of Yellow Brick Road, where he continues to help Australians access their dream homes. After decades of experience in business, he's committed to sharing the insights and knowledge of Australia's leading business minds through the mentor platform, which helps small business owners and entrepreneurs come together, grow and succeed. To achieve this mission, he pays forward his knowledge and that of others to the Australian entrepreneurs through, te through television, podcasts, books and online channels. Moreover, he's an adjunct professor for the banking and finance and business law and tax at University of New South Wales Business School and works with the university me to mentor tomorrow's business men leaders. Away from business, he sits on the board of the Sydney Roosters and he looks forward to holding up the Premiership Cup next year. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Mr. Mark Boris. G'day, thanks very much. Um, I've been doing these for years, um, but it's great to uh, be able to do it in person again this year. Um, so thank you, uh, it's great to see everybody here today. Um, the topic that was uh, proposed to you is um, property, property prices. You know, of course, we're going to talk about property prices, we're going to talk about affordability, we're going to talk about affordability, we're going to talk about interest rates, if we're going to talk about interest rates, we're going to talk about inflation and other things. So um, I, I'm going to sort of go through that process, but I think the most important thing is why I'm doing this conversation with you today is because as a broker, and I'm assuming most of you are brokers. If you're a broker, um, there are two parts to being a broker. There's a competent broker, that's somebody who you know reads all their emails every day or whatever it is they receive in their mail, telling them how to update themselves in relation to what the greatest next product is, who, you know what ANZ is doing, what NAB's doing, what uh, you know everybody's doing in terms of product um, product changes and uh, how that might may well suit your clients. It's about um, you know working in the best interest of your client, making sure that he or she, if they've got too heavy an interest rate or the repayment schedule is too hard um, that you look at refinancing them where that can be done um, a lot easier last year than this year um, and uh, so that's competency and you know like most of us are competent otherwise we probably wouldn't have been able to get here today competency is an important factor it's a necessary factor but it's not a sufficient factor and in terms of um, getting new business in a tougher market let's assume the market does get tougher or is getting tougher um, the, the, the next way that you succeed or remain successful is to add value. And, uh, and, and basically that means that you've got to get, each one of us has got to get a greater percentage or a greater share of a shrinking market. And a shrinking market may, mean, may be as a result of the amount of money, le the amount of money we lend is now less um, per transaction, which makes sense because you know, house prices are coming down, therefore people got to pay less, but also, um, you know, because of the, um, the the way we assess people's ability to service, um, given interest rates have increased, um, you would expect that people are going to borrow less. So, therefore, if they're borrowing less, you've got to either do more transactions, or you've got to be able to live off less a, a, a lesser fee and less upfront, lesser trail. So, competency is important about getting the deal set, but at value add is about how do I grow at a faster rate than the marketplace. So. If the market system or if the system of the marketplace is growing at say 5% per annum, and previously, just for argument's sake, you and your organization had 1%, had 10% share of that, which is you know fairly significant. Um, if the market doesn't grow at 5%, even when it grows at 4.5%, in order for you to maintain your position, you've got to grow at a faster rate than everybody else. Like the old story about uh, you know uh, David and John, they're in the jungle, 
and uh, there's a tiger chasing him and David turns to John and says, mate, there's a tiger on our ass here, he's just about to, he's about to devour us. John says, I'm not that worried, all I've got to do is outrun you. So that's how each one of us have got to be. We've got to outrun our competitor, our broker competitor. And bear in mind, you know, we get all these stats about how our industry is delivering to the banking system, greater percentages of um, borrowers every, every time I turn around, I see a, a stat come out, like some people are saying it's around 70% at the moment of all mortgages that um, originated through a broker. Um, we have to, that, that is also a function of there being many more brokers. So we have to not only be outperform everybody else, we have to outperform the system. And the way you do that is through the value add. Now, what is the value add? It's not about knowing about the products. That's, that's the competency add, that's the competency piece. The value add, as far as I'm concerned, is about the conversation we have with the client. And when the client, you know, the client might, these days, the lead time between getting a deal done and, sorry, meeting a client or having a first conversation with a potential client and getting the deal done is a lot greater than it ever has been in the past. How do I keep that client interested, potential client interested in my conversation? How do I make sure they don't go to somewhere else? Now these days, <clears throat> pardon me, conversations are not just had in person, they're had through various social mediums. Let's assume you are not on the social mediums for a moment. And by the way, that's a bad assumption to make because you should be, but let's assume you're not on the social mediums. Um, and, and, let's and therefore your conversation actually is in person or by email perhaps or by text or by telephone, then you're competing against an organization like Yellow Brick Road, where I am hitting up your, your customer in some way, socially, with my conversation. And in my conversation, I'm trying to value add. And what am I trying to add? Well, what value am I trying, how, how am I trying to add the value? Well, I'm trying to have a conversation around the current narrative that exists in the marketplace today. And the current narrative that exists in the marketplace today is house prices, um, auction clearance rates, um, the number of houses presented for auction, um, house price uh, falls or dwelling price falls in various marketplaces, wherever the marketplaces happen to be, um, and your customer doesn't necessarily invest in, if they live in Sydney, doesn't necessarily invest in Sydney, it could be investing in Adelaide. Um, what, is the, uh, what is the vacancy rate in the particular area that a, a customer is going to invest in? Uh, what is the uh, yield in that particular environment? Etc. And what do you think, you the broker, you're the closest thing in the world to the Reserve Bank that your customer will find? Sure, they'll read the newspapers and stuff like that, but you, they really see you as the person who's sort of got like a, a, a direct connection to Philip Lowe. And uh, whilst none of us do, they see that. So if you are trying to compete with someone who's really digitally savvy and active, someone like Yellowbrick Road, then you have to make sure you have the same amount of information that we have and that you pass this on to your client. So what are we talking about now? Well, we were talking about making sure you're on top of your game. Not just about what ANZ or NAB or CBA or Westpac or Suncorp or Bank of Queensland or whoever it is you're dealing with will do for your client in terms of getting the deal approved. But on top of your game means what is the narrative that's going on around the place? Not just what Albanese is talking about, not just what the Treasurer is talking about, not just what uh, the Sydney Morning Herald is talking about or the Financial Review is talking about, but what is everybody socially talking about, social mediums? And then what is the output after that? So let's just talk about how do you get prepared for that? Because that's my, my discussion today. How do you get prepared for this stuff? So there's a lot of noise out there. Um, and what, what should you be reading? Well, I'm, I don't know what you should be reading, but I'll share with you what I read. And I'll, come, and I'll do that right at the end, okay? So I don't, definitely don't look at, I do read the AFR, etc., but only be by virtue of habit. But I, I don't rely on them for what I need to know. I definitely don't read things like Sydney Morning Herald or the Melbourne Age or the Courier Mail or whatever it is. I, d I don't read those newspapers to find out what their commentators are, are saying about interest rates and house prices. I, de I definitely don't. Um, mainly because, you know, if I could just, with great respect to those organisations, um, they're commentators and they don't even read what the Reserve Bank says. They read what somebody else has said on, on, the, on the wires. So they read what uh, Reuters has said or what AAP said, whatever's been put out there by a person interpreting what the government has said or what the Reserve Bank said or what you know, one of the big banks has said in relation to house prices. What, what did Bill Evans say 
They're just interpreting someone else's interpretation. And sometimes it's two or three times done. And a lot of times these particular individuals aren't even qualified. I, don't, I mean academically qualified. I'm not bagging, they're journalists. They've got to cover a lot of stuff. So they're not as concentrated like we are on our particular topic. So I don't read those. I do look at it, but I don't take any notice of it. So we, we're all time poor. All of us are time poor. So it's really important, therefore, for us to make sure that we just look at what's relevant. So if I could tell you the very first thing that is the most relevant thing that you sh everybody in this room should look at every single and, uh, Tuesday, 2.31 p.m., first Tuesday of every month at 2.31 p.m., there's only one thing you should be looking at, and that is what the Reserve Bank said. Now, anybody can go to rba.com.au and you look at what the Reserve Bank, just go in there, go in there at 2.31, not 2.30, but 2.31, first Tuesday every month, in a page and one paragraph is what the Reserve Bank says. The Reserve Bank governor allegedly puts this together. He doesn't because it's done by his secretariat, which is made up of 500 economists in Reserve Bank. And they put out a note. And the note's about seven paragraphs. And it's been seven paragraphs for as long as I've been reading it. And the same seven paragraphs differently filled in, but the same topics of each of the seven paragraphs is what gets done every single time. Every single time. It's very intuitive and easy to read. It's not directed at economists. It's not directed at bankers. It's directed at the average consumer. And that's who we are. We're the average consumer of information. So you don't need to see three or four interpretations of that down the track. You don't need to see it written by someone else who has an agenda, whether it's left or right, as to what that statement means. We all should be reading that immediately after it is released and be then able to add value to our customer base by pushing something out to our customers, whether it's socially or just through an email, sending emails out to all my customers or by ringing up those relevant customers who I think should know what's going on, they then say, oh, wow, that's cool. So-and-so just rang me about what the Reserve Bank just said and also told me what's important out of that statement from what the Reserve Bank says. And usually it's only a couple of things. Clearly it's amount the interest rate rises are. But when then, then, then our customers, I'm talking about um, uh, value add here. When our customers then, they go off and read all the newspapers and they get you know, scared to death from what they hear other commentators say, we then need to give some context. That's another way we add value to our customer. Now context is important and I want to talk to you right now about the context. So if I just quickly dial up this statement. This is the, uh, the I think, 2nd or 3rd of August statement by the Reserve Bank. Um, more recently, when the put interest rates up by 0.5%, the, one of the most important paragraphs is, is, is as, follow, as, as follows. It's not the most, but it's one of. The board places a high priority on the return of inflation to the 2 to 3% range over time, while keeping the economy on an even keel. The path to achieve this is a, to, to, to achieve this balance is a narrow one. In other words, presents challenges and clouded in uncertainty, not least of, because of global developments. Now, I just want to get, I want to talk about, get some context around that. So why two to three percent? So, you know, we keep, well, two to three percent, we keep talking this two to three percent, but why? Your client may want to know why two to three percent. Do you know why two to three percent? Do you know where, when and two to three percent became a thing? Well, I'm going to tell you. Two to three percent became a thing in 1996, when the last review, at the end of the last review of the Reserve Bank Board, we're now talking about a new review of the Reserve Bank Board on Albanese, but the last one was done beginning of 90s, late, 80, late 80s, early 90s, but didn't sort of get conclude, concluded and executed until after that period. And they concluded that in order for the Reserve Bank to um, undertake, or rather execute, on its two mandates, that is, the prosperity and welfare of all Australians. That's two parts, prosperity and welfare, different things. Prosperity is about growth, welfare is about controlling inflation when there's no growth. In other words, I want to, we want to make sure that there is not a whole lot of Australians who start to suffer when inflation gets out of control. In order to do those two things, in 1996, it was determined that, rightly or wrongly, that inflation should be maintained between two and three percent. Goldilocks is between two and three percent. You won't ever know why that was the case because it has never been explained to us why two to three percent is the right number. It is relevant to other, other 
Federal Reserves and Reserve Banks around the world, equivalents around the world. It's something that everybody agreed on at the time. It's still the mantra today, many, you know, 25 years later or whatever it is. It's, a, it's a, you know, there is no real logic around it. It is a fiction. It's a fiction. It doesn't really exist. But at the end of the day, it does exist because that is what the Reserve Bank's operating off. So it does have an effect. It is an effic fictional in terms of its philosophy. But that is an, an important value add to your clients because your clients may be wondering, well, why two to 3%? When did that come in? So you can sort of send a note to your clients. And these are examples of add value, right? Two to 3%, does that have to be 2.5? And what happens if it's not 3%? What happens if it's 3.5 inflation? What happens if it's right now 6.1? or potentially 7.75, which is what's been predicted by the end of this calendar year. What does that mean? Well, another value add is to give it sense, is to say to your client, well, the general view of our Reserve Bank at least, is they like to have a real interest rate of net zero. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means if the interest rate is 2.5%, the cash rate I'm talking about. If the interest rate is 2.5% and if inflation is 2.5%, then really the, the net real interest rate, effective interest rate is zero because you know you take inflation away. There's no point in earning 2.5% per annum if inflation eats into it at 2.5% per annum because that means I'm getting zero, I'm getting nothing. So the Reserve Bank's position, where they like to be in normalized times, not now, but normalized times, and we haven't seen normalized times for a long time, but normalized times is to be net zero or slightly above, closer to 1%, but nowhere below zero and not really anything above 1%. So all of a sudden it starts to make a bit of sense. If what people are saying is that the Reserve Bank's position is that they would like to see interest rates between two and 3%, let's just say, for example, between two and 3% means two and a half, just mathematically, to make it easy. Um, and if they, that's their desired position. And if you're trying to predict where interest, where inflation, where interest rates, I should say, should be, study it. If they would like to have inflation between two and three percent, so let's say two and a half percent in an ideal world, normalized world. And if they believe in what they are currently doing in terms of putting rates up, that they will get down to two and a half percent, then at a minimum, by the end of this calendar year, the cash rate should be at two and a half percent. Right now it's 1.85, at a minimum, because that's assuming that inflation by the end of this calendar year is two and a half percent. Now that assumption is on a slippery footing, but that is the lowest interest rate, cash rate, official rate that you would expect to see, the lowest of the range you expect to see by the end of this calendar year, assuming that the interest rate changes that have been made up to date are effective. Now, we all know, well, none of us know, no one knows this, but we all have a sense, at least, that it could get close to that, but it's probably more likely to be around five or 6% by the end of this year. Now, it doesn't mean that the Reserve Bank is going to increase the cash rate to 5 or 6%. Because remember, they have to be able to look after the growth of the economy, the prosperity of the economy too. So they can't kill off the prosperity of the economy. They can't kill growth whilst they're trying to tame or achieve welfare for our people who will suffer with inflation. So they've got this fine balance that they're trying to maintain all the time. Again, this needs to be explained because once you explain something to a customer, you give them confidence in you, you knowing what you're talking about, but also you put them at ease. So you want your customer to feel as though you're someone that is the hand of reason in uncertain times. That's the value add. It's not, yes, I can get your loan approved because someone else will say that. Another broker is definitely going to say that. There's always another broker around the corner, even if they don't think they can get the thing approved, they'll say it. There's always somebody ready to pull your pants down, every single time. 
there, in our industry, if 70% of all loans in this country are being delivered by brokers, I can tell you it's a very competitive market amongst ourselves. Even in this room, some of you have probably butted heads with other people in this room. You definitely would have run into other brokers who are trying to churn your book, and you'll probably try to churn their book, which is fine. They're the rules of the game. But you've got to, therefore, you've got to work out how do I add something better to my clients. So keep my clients on my book. I don't want to lose my book. I don't want to lose my clients. I don't want to get churned. That's value add. How do I give them value add? Because after that, after you've set the loan, there's no more competency involved. The deal's done. How do I add value? And if I'm trying to get new clients away from somebody else, again, assume you are just as competent, or more importantly, the other person who you are competing against is just as competent as you are. Never underestimate the enemy. Therefore, how do I make myself a little bit better? Value add. What is value add? It's explanation, making people feel like they understand something, giving them more logic, give them the history behind something that is happening so that they can say, oh, you know, I get that. And that, give them something that they can talk about. Try and log in or lock into the, nas uh, the national narrative, whatever that is. Try and keep ahead of every other medium that's out there, or at least know what those other mediums are and parlay that back to your cu customer. So I just explained to you, the very first thing is knowing what the Reserve Bank has actually said. Not, oh, the Reserve Bank come out a half percent in, in, in interest rate increase. Knowing what they said, what did they say in the statement? And then trying to explain parts of it. And I just tried to explain to you one sentence. But you know, one sentence is the two to 3% range, which is really important. Growth. Oh, sorry, prosperity and welfare, the Reserve Bank's narrative. Why two to three percent? Something that came off the last review. Oh, that, that, that op opens up another conversation with your client. We're going for another review. In that review, they might review the inflation rate. They might say inflation should be, we should be going for three to four percent. Who knows? I don't know what's going to happen. Then that review is, but you, then it gives you an opportunity to get into the next conversation. You are trying to open up conversations with your client and adding value to their knowledge base based on your knowledge base. And you, you are then connecting them to the Reserve Bank. There's no point just regurgitating what you've heard in a newspaper or what you've heard some, one of your neighbours say. So just on the last interest rate increase, the half percent, the last two interest rate increases, a half percent, people keep talking about, it. oh, it's you know, unprecedented. I hate that fucking word. Like, how we've been hearing that word for the last three years. Unprecedented. Like, you know, everything's unprecedented. Rush, Rush is unprecedented. COVID was unprecedented. Interest rate increases are unprecedented. Yeah, sure. Give me some context about that, please. So, let me explain something to you. The assumption that sits around using monetary policy to control inflation is a very important assumption. And that is... It's about changing people's behavior. So, some of us probably watched that Netflix movie about Facebook psychologists, how they use algorithms to manipulate the behavior of users of Facebook and Instagram and other social mediums. Did, did anyone watch that? Okay. They use the best psychologists in the world to understand how nudge theory works and how likes work and all that stuff how they can actually get below um, our consciousness and make us do things and or subscribe to, th to things or undertake and engage in things that we would not ordinarily do. It was about behavioral change. And they know what to do, how to change your behavior. The Reserve Bank's role in, in controlling inflation at least or when they're trying to, when we don't have an inflation problem, we're trying to um, increase growth or prosperity, that is trying to get us to spend more, is, uh, is basically the same as what Facebook was doing. It's about changing people's behavior. Now the tool they use to change our behavior is not like what Facebook does, it's nowhere near as sophisticated. This is just an instrument, they call a blunt instrument. It's about hitting you over the head basically with a high rate of interest in these times to stop you from spending money. So why is 
I mean, th and that's an important conversation. And w we actually need to have this on a national level. You know, why is it that the people who ha hold mortgages should be the ones who get inflation under control so that those people who don't have a mortgage feel saved? And the Reserve Bank can say, oh, we got inflation under control. Give us a pat on the back. I mean, it, 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 it just doesn't make sense to me, but in any event, it does exist. And it's about managing or manipulating the behavior of borrowers. So when you look at that, and I want to get on to why half a percent, why is it unprecedented? Well, I'll tell you why it is. 20 years ago, or more, from 20 years and going back, the average age of a borrower in this country was 24 years of age. So 20 years and beyond, not 20 years up to now, but, 20, but go back 20 years and go beyond, you know, we go back 30, 40, 50 years. We got married at 21 or 22. We went and bought a house because our parents told us to save our money and we went and borrowed some money. We got a mortgage. And we're 24 years of age. So the average borrower is 24 years of age. Today, 20 years later, the average borrower age is 34 years of age. Now that, I know you're going to say, well, I'm lending money to people 25. Yeah, I'm not saying that there are not people who sit outside the bell curve. Of course there are. But the, those people sitting inside the bell curve are 30, on average, are 34 years of age. The average age of a person who's paid down their loan is 52 years of age. So the people who get affected by interest rate changes, whether they're up or down, are between 34 and 52. And if you look at that as a size of the total population of people in this country who affect things like household expenditure, which is, goes into GDP calculations, that number has shrunk over the last 20 years. Well, today, relative to 20 years ago, there is a lot less people who sit in that sample. So if, you know, if you're thinking this through, if I want to use interest rate increases to change someone's behavior, but the group I am addressing is a smaller group, then I've got to do two things. I've got to increase the amount by which I increase interest rates to have the same effect as I did 20 years ago. And I've got to do more rapidly. I've got to do it more, more, consecutive, more consecutively, which is one of the explanations behind why we had since May um, 50 and August, we've had um, 1.75, percentage worth of increases. So that's a, you know, it's three fifties and a 25. Unprecedented. No, it's not, it is unprecedented. Yeah, sure, it hasn't happened past. But, get, but the thing that's actually unprecedented is the cohort of people that we're affecting. It's much smaller. And the cohort of people that we're affecting, because it's smaller, therefore have to have a bigger hit and have to have it more often in order to control inflation. We've had inflation run off, run away from us in the past at a much faster rate. But we haven't seen these sorts of increases at the same clip rate because the people that, were, that we were addressing, the colder people we were addressing, were much larger. So it's, it's important to have that context in your mind. And there's a value add to your client base. And you can explain why it's happening this way. It's, it's about as I said about, and it's not about telling your client, this is not about lecturing your client, this is about conversing, ask, look, seeking their feedback, having a conversation. It's really a big value add. So what I just covered off, who, am I, who, who is the Reserve Bank addressing? So therefore I should expect more rate increases. Why should I expect more rate increases? Because they've got to at a minimum get to net zero, which is what the Reserve Bank wants to have. And assuming that they can get inflation down to two and a half percent by the end of this year, which is not going to happen, but assuming that, that's the be very best position we can get to. They don't want it to be less, because if it's less, they get into negative territory, they've got to start reducing interest rates. So let's assume the very lowest inflation rate will be two and a half percent. Then at a minimum, interest rates got to be 2.5 percent. If they're 1.85 percent, pretty easy to say to your client, I'm betting there's going to be at least two more rate rises of 50 basis points because they need 50 basis point rate, rate rises between here and December, the December meeting, which is like the 3rd or 4th of December, and probably another 25 basis points on top of that. So it's a no-brainer 
that we're going to get three more rate rises. The only difference is we don't know which months they're going to be. And we don't know whether it's going to be 50, 50, 25, or 25, 50, 50, or 50, 20. Who cares about that? That's just nothing. So your clients are interested to hear what your view is. This is not secret information. It's logic. It makes complete sense. Then you might say to your clients, yeah, but and by the way, if you then go back and look at what the big banks are saying, some of the big banks are saying, CBA's position is 2.6% by December this year. I'm saying 2.5%, but the, you know, who's going to argue over 0.1? No one. But there are other banks, Westpac, and who, you know, I have a great deal of respect for Bill Evans, who's the chief economist at Westpac, who, by the way, has called every rate reduction and every rate increase, both the amount and the date, going back for the last 20 years, he's considered to be the number one, even though I notice I think ANZ's here. ANZ probably won't agree with that, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Bill's, Bill's a gun and is a gun. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, I think Saul Eastlake is the ANZ guy, but he's pretty good too. So, but like, they're, they're all great economists, but ANZ, uh, the other banks are saying, Westpac, for example, saying 3.5% by the end of this year. So there's a 1% difference. Now, 3.5% may be more correct because if inflation is 3.5%, uh, sorry, yeah, if the, uh, the inflation rate gets down to 3.5% by the end of this calendar year, then to have a net zero, you would expect the cash rate to be 3.5%. That sort of makes sense. So the range is the conversation, but the logic around why the range sits there is the thing you really need to understand. Why 2.5%? Why does uh, Commonwealth Bank say 2.5 or 2.6%? Why do they say that? That's what I just explained, net zero. And it's the, it's the lowest possible rate. Why 3.5%? Well, it's just because Westpac believe that inflation will be reduced to 3.5% or near there by the end of this year. So they get to net zero, that therefore the cash rate has to be 3.5%, which basically means working backwards, we're at 1.85, you know how many rate rises we need to have. And the reason why we're having really big rate rises is because we've got a smaller cohort of people to attach it to and therefore we have to have the same effect because what they're trying to do is try change people's behavior. Stop spending. It doesn't matter whether inflation is demand driven, um, supply chain driven, Ukraine driven, uh, they're all speculation. No one knows. If you read what the Reserve Bank says, they go, well, we don't really know. They cite these things, but everybody cites this stuff. There's no, no one really knows what's causing this. But in terms of, all of those things are causing it, but no one really knows which is the biggest cause, which is the biggest percentage, or is it Australians being, having too much money to spend? We don't know. And, and, and I, I don't know who has put any information out to say that they do know. So there's no point trying to work that out. So let's just talk about inflation for a moment. Inflation is made up of 91 categories, 91 subunits, so to speak. Um, and you know, they range from food and petrol and uh, tobacco and um, alcohol, communications, transport, housing, rents. There's so many categories and everything's weighted differently. So some, some things have a far greater effect on inflation than others. Lettuces, for example, have very little effect on anything. <laughs> um, I'm serious, but yet, yet, I mean, it's a good example. It doesn't affect inflation. Lettuce, if it's, it can be 50 bucks. It's not gonna have any effect on inflation. Yet, that's all the media talked about. This is an example of the noise that I say to stop talk, <coughs> listening to. But by the way, your customer, they probably have no idea. They think, maybe think lettuce does have an effect on inflation. And it's a good, it's an entree. You see that on television? There's an entree for you to communicate. Instead of just randomly talking to your customer base, look for a reason. Shit, they might be getting worried. Something getting jammed down their throat by the media. How can I use this as an opportunity to talk to them? Where I'm not actually asking, do they want to refinance? Are they happy with the current loan? Are they looking to buy an investment property? That, that's a bit too obvious. How can I use these opportunities that are out there in the market, which you, know, you, you see them, you hear them, you, you know, we, by the end of the day, you don't even have to watch the evening news. You've been hit up by all the news 30, 40 times. You, you're, you've got to be thinking how can I use one of these as an opportunity at least once a week to communicate? And 
lettuces doesn't affect inflation. So you can tell your clients, there's no effect on inflation. More likely the effect on inflation will be petrol prices, or more likely the effect of inflation will be when the government's um, tax rebate on the price of petrol disappears at the end of this month. Or more likely an effect on inflation will be the cost of building materials. Or more likely will be the effect on inflation is um, the increase in rents. Now, okay, well, how do I find out about this stuff? You know, what's important? Well, a good source of this information, so I said go to the rba.com. By the way, the RBA is not perfect. There are people calling for, you know, the resignation of the Reserve Bank governor. He may well have not used the correct language in October, November last year. He may well not have. I, I'm not going to give an opinion on it. But it's all irrelevant. The, still the very best source of what's happening with interest rates, because these are the dudes that set interest rates, is what the Reserve Bank says, whether the media like him or not. That's who sets the rates. Whether he gets it right or wrong, it doesn't matter. That's the rate of which we will lend. So that's all that matters. If you want to then have a conversation with the client about things like um, vacancy rates, or things like number of properties up for auction, or things like clearance rates, or things like um, the increase in, uh, for example, uh, rental costs in, on an average basis, like across Australia, the best place is CoreLogic. I mean, there's PropTrack as well, but CoreLogic. Now, most of you sit in organisations, so it, that re uh, um, um, CoreLogic requires a subscription. It's not very expensive. But the work that CoreLogic does is being looked at by all the economists. It's being requoted across the board, like literally every day by every economist who writes an article. Um, we use it at, at YBR. It's very good data. It's, it comes out weekly. So they'll tell you what the auction, the auction clearance rates are. They'll tell you the number of properties up for, the, up for sale at auction this, this week compared to this time last year, compared to last week as well. They give you good comparables. They tell you what the clearance rates are. So somehow, I don't know how they get the information, but they find out what the clearance rates are. They'll tell you, they'll tell you what the, uh, the pricing is. So for example, in Sydney, house prices in the last quarter have fallen by 5.6%. In Melbourne, they've fallen by 3.9% in the last quarter. In Brisbane, they've fallen by 0.7%. In Adelaide, they've gone up by 3.5%. In Perth, they've gone up by 1.2%. Now that's important information, but what's really important after that is why in Adelaide have prices gone up when in Sydney they've gone down? Why do you think that is the case? Well, it's pretty obvious. The average price of a house in Adelaide is $650,000. So it's, it's a very borrowable, very, um, very affordable is the word, and not affected or not as sensitive interest rate rises as buying something in Sydney for a million dollars. But also on top of that, in Adelaide, the vacancy rate is zero. Nothing's vacant. Something comes up for rent, 50 people turn up. Where do I get this information? It's core logic. Every week they print the same stuff. They're telling you vacancy rates, prices, average uh, clearances. And then you can dig a little bit deeper into what core logic say. Core logic will tell you. You know, we, we are all, clients need to know this. We're always hit with national numbers. So house prices in Australia are fall, gonna fall by 20% annualized. Okay, cool. But what does that mean? If you go and have a look at, I just gave you some examples on um, house price falls in Sydney at, in Sydney last quarter. That, if you go and have a look at what CoreLogic prints, they tell you, they stratify, they go top 25% of house prices and the bottom 25% of house prices. The top 25% of house price falls has been 6%. The bottom 25% of house price falls is only 1.7%. Uh, this is Sydney. It's different in Melbourne, I think it's 1.2 at the bottom. But because, you, know, you know, and if you work out, these are averages, you know, average price falls multiplied by the number of properties sold and the price of the property. That tells you something, that house price sensitivity is a lot less to all these interest rate increases that we've seen. We've seen quite a lot, and quite a, by large amounts. Very, uh, way less effective to the house price reductions for the bottom 25% of value. So it makes sense that there's less panic in that territory, because there's less people feeling less pain in terms of value, wealth effect. They're feeling less pain. 
It's the people at the top end, the cop and all, in terms of the transactions they're conducting. But maybe they can afford to cop it more anyway. But it doesn't matter. But that's another value add to your client base. It might give them peace of mind, but it also might give them an idea. They might say, well, wait a minute, if house prices have only decreased in the bottom 25%, that is anything under a million dollars in Sydney for argument's sake, um, and, but rental, rentals have gone up by 9.8% nationally across the board for the last 12 months, 2.8% in just the last quarter in Sydney. There's an arbitrage. So if that opens the conversation with your clients, well, maybe you're gonna buy, you know, it's cheaper, but it's not getting as hit hard in that bottom 25%, in other words, anything under a million bucks. But guess what? Your rental returns have increased significantly. So yields are starting to look a lot better. So if yields are starting to look a lot better, it just gives you, you're not, I'm not suggesting you advise your client that they should be buying investment properties, but it might be a way of having another conversation, opening up a conversation. Where do I get this information? Core logic. You need to get the information, read it. It's not that difficult. It is really simple stuff to read. It's, it's actually quite interesting for us boring people um, who operate in these environments. Um, that's all of us in the room, not me. I'm talking about just me, yeah, all of us. Um, I'm including everybody in, that, in the room. And, but it's, it's quite interesting information. But again, it gives you an opportunity to do a value-add conversation with your client and to get them thinking. And then to get them to say, I feel comfortable. Maybe you're just trying to put them in a comfortable position. Maybe you're trying to get them to engage and maybe, and just get, getting them to get that little bit extra confidence to go and buy something even though you're not suggesting it, you're not advising them on that. Now, who do I read? What do I read? Okay. A, I read the Reserve Bank. Now, when the Reserve Bank puts its statement on the first Tuesday of every month, it's usually followed about a week later by a further statement, which is a lot more detailed. If you're into it, that's worth reading. But if you're not into it, just read the, you know, the page and a half they put out on the first Tuesday of every month of 231. I also read a thing called livewire.com.au. It's a free subscription, livewire.com.au. When you go to livewire.com.au, there's only one person on there to read. Do not read anybody else, because you're just gonna waste your time. Read Christopher Joy, J-O-Y-E, from Cooler Bar Investments. Read what Christopher Joy's got to say. He's got a, a business of 45 people, half of them are PhDs, there's one in Melbourne, one in the city here, one in Bonner Junction. The reason I know about it is because I actually funded him and set it up originally. I sold that two years ago, but he is a genius. He's a PhD, worked at the Reserve Bank, used to advise Malcolm Turnbull, worked at Goldman Sachs. The guy's much older now. He writes for the AFR, most read person in the AFR outside of that um, gossip column on the back, um, most read person. Um, he writes for livewire.com and he writes on interest rates, inflation and the Australian property market. More importantly, he writes on prices. What is happening? He also subscribes to CoreLogic and he quotes Tim Lawless every, every week. Read what Chris has got to say. He builds predictive, scientifically pre built predictive models about pricing for the future, both on both on um, price, property prices and, in, and interest rates. He's got better connections, and he's got more people working for him than any of us ever gonna get in this particular concentrated area. And he just doesn't, he just loves telling everybody what he thinks and what he, what he more importantly, not what he thinks, what he's deducted from the data. It's easy to read. It's usually like a page and a half. Livewire.com, Chris Joy. That's one end, and he's very, um, uh, it's called, he's, not, he's very bearish about where the property market's gonna go. So that'll give you one perspective. He's gonna give you the right side of politics's view on where he sees the property market. And I read that stuff every week. As I said, it's a free subscription. Anyone can have it, get it. On the left side, you need to do, get some balance though. On the left side, go to a, a website called um, Fear and Greed. It's written by, it's owned by a guy called, and another guy called Sean Armour. Sean Armour used to be the chief editor of the Financial Review, um, was the banking editor of the Financial Review, then ended up running, you know, chief operations of Fairfax. He's now on his own, owns a thing called Fear and Greed, and he engages a guy called Stephen Kokoulis. Stephen Kokoulis was the advisor, chief economic advisor to Gillard when she was prior PM. Uh, he is a very, very bright economist. He has a different view. He has, and him and uh, Joy, always clashing, 
always debating, sometimes on TV, but always debating with each other. Just Kukulas is spelled K-O-U-K-O-U-L-A-S, Stephen P-H, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Stephen Kukulas. He writes often, you'll see him on Sky News and all sorts of places, but he, every week he's on, every week or every second week he's on fear and greed. Well, greed and fear, I don't know which one is, fear and greed, greed and fear. Unfortunately, you have to subscribe to that, but if you're in a firm, it's like not much, 100 bucks a month or something, worth subscribing to, just, but just read what he's got to say. Run by an ex-AFR guy. Now, Stephen Kukulis, I think, is the best person in predicting where interest rates are going. And, and again, he, he's an economist. He's like, a, his nickname's Kooky. He sits around all day long looking at graphs and, you know, building algorithms and all sorts of shit. And uh, he loves it. He's a weirdo. I love him. He's a good mate. But he'll do the work and then he can put it into really easy speak. He'll give you one end of the spectrum. He thinks house prices will stabilize. He's talking about a 10 or 12% correction. Then you've got the other end where Joy says it's gonna be a 20% correction based on data. They're both based on data. They're both totally different. By the way, this is what you expect in a dysfunctional market. We are in a dysfunction at the moment. And the dysfunction is driven by no market. And no market basically means you don't have a willing buyer and a willing seller. We've got willing buyers at the moment but not prepared to pay the price that the sellers want, which means the sellers are not willing, the vendors are not willing. The vendors have not yet met the market, which is the reason why when you read CoreLogic, it says we had you know double the amount of auctions this time last week compared to this time last year, double the amount of properties on the market for auction, but only 55% clearance rate. Whereas this time last year, we had 85% clearance rate. We have a dysfunction. So don't, don't, you know, your clients, your customers shouldn't get nervous when they go 55% clearance rates. No, we have a dysfunctional market. And the reason we have a dysfunctional market is because vendors don't need to sell yet, yet. They have not met the buyer's price. And what's determining the buyer's price is that we can't arrange a loan equal to what they need to get to buy at the vendor's price. As a rule of thumb, for every half a percent interest rate increase that, we, that the retailers do, as a result of the Reserve Bank increasing by half a percent, lenders will lend 5% less. For every half a percent, there's a 5% reduction. So you work it out. If um, you know, interest rates go up by 2%, that's four lots of those, that's a 20% reduction in prices. And that's a sort of just a bad, not a bad rule of thumb. Another conversation, another value add with a client. They don't know that, they don't know shit. For every half percent, the rates go up, there's a 5% reduction in the amount of money we're gonna lend, we can, uh, our lender's gonna lend or you know, thereabouts. Looking for conversation starters. How you choose, what platforms you choose to have those conversations is up to you, up to your technology and where you feel. It doesn't really matter whether you get to people on social mediums or direct. At the end of the day, the best medium or the best platform is face-to-face. -face. There's nothing better than face-to-face. -face. Hold a seminar for your clients. Bring them all in. Say we're gonna you know, talk about this stuff. And you can tell them, you. You know, you, 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 you know, this is what you've gleaned from reading Stephen Kukulis and Chris Joy. You can regurgitate what the two ends of the spectrum are saying. It's pretty easy. I mean, all of us have written essays. You know, write an essay. Read what these two guys have said over the last five publications each. Then go and have a look at what the money market's saying. Go and have a look at what Westpac's saying. Go and have a look at what Bill Evans is saying. Then go and have a look at what Saul Leslie's saying. Go and have a look at what Nab's saying. Go and look at Shane Oliver's saying. And just... Just quote people. Get them all in the room at once. Like I've got you in the room today. I didn't organize this, Dino did, but I'm just saying it's an opportunity. Just have these conversations. So remember, as a broker, you must be competent. That is, you've got to know the products and you've got to know your client's details. But you've got to add value in these tougher markets. Before, it didn't, you didn't have to be add value before because it was like mortgages during the COVID period Clients wanting more, it was like manna from heaven, just falling over us. Because there was money out there, a 0.1 of a percent, which the banks could get access to, and they were lending at you know, 1.99% fixed rate for three years or four years or two years, whatever your client decided to do. And everybody was racing to buy property with the rears pin back and their tails up. And it's probably, you, we'll probably never see that ever again. I mean, those rates I'm talking about. I've never seen those rates, and I've been doing this in this game for like 35 years. I've never seen interest rates that low, fixed rates. I've never seen variable rates that low either. They were 2.1 and stuff like that with $5,000 cash back. 
what the hell? I feel like I'm going into a casino in Las Vegas. You know, like cash back, ching ching, you know, like, well, it's a no brainer for us to um, undertake our bid duties. <laughs> we say to our client, you should take this rate because it's lower than the rate you got and you're gonna get $5,000. Mind you, it's a different conversation now because they won't be able to borrow the same amount of money they used to borrow because, because of the way you know, the calculation, our calculations work, assuming that their incomes haven't increased. Another piece of information I just want to share with you before I open up to questions. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious where I think interest rates are going to go by the end of this calendar year um, and why they're going to go there. But is this, the general view about unemployment in this country at 3.5% is going to create price pressures on right wages. In other words, um, make employers pay more money to the employees, therefore the employers who, who are selling a product or a service pass that extra cost on, therefore creating wage-driven inflation. What's interesting is that CBA did a survey last month of 300,000 customers, not a bad survey, of, by, by looking at Obviously, they must have de-identified every customer, but by looking at the amount of money that comes in as their wages automatically into their account. 300,000, that's a bloody good sample, right? And the conclusion was, on average, in the last 12 months, the only increase in wage, the only wage increase is 2%. So there's no big, massive wage inflationary pressure currently that's creating that's causing businesses to pass on high costs to, to the customer, to, con, to the consumer, to create inflation. So it's not a bad fact to know. Now, where did I find that out? Chris Joy wrote about it. Where did Chris Joy write about it? Well, Chris Joy just talks to everybody and he's just a nosy parker and uh, he drives everyone mad, but he's doing our work for us. So, if you want to read all those, you know, read all what all the commentators are saying, by all means do it. And, and just use it as a way to work out what maybe gives you an opportunity to talk to your client in terms of adding value, assuming you're competent. Then when you open the conversation, make sure you have something to tell your client that is valuable. So it's the why something is happening as opposed to just what's happening. So there's no point just saying, oh, it's a you know, half percent increase in interest rates as Reserve Bank met today, 231. Okay, great. They're going to find that in. They're already probably going to know it. But why did it happen? And why is the Reserve Bank chasing 2 to 3%? What's behind all this stuff? And where am I going to get it? I eliminate the noise. Be efficient in relation to the time that you spend reading stuff. I, I'm suggesting to, telling you what I read. Core Logic, Livewire. I listen to fear, uh, greed and fear, fear and greed, and I, and I try to keep up with what the chief economists at the, th at the four big banks say. And occasionally I listen, and I also listen to what AMP says as well, Shane Oliver. So it, it's, they're the important things that I think we as brokers need to do to make sure A, we remain re relevant, we maintain our client base and our book, because that's pretty bloody important to all of us, that we don't, someone else is not churning us, in other words, our client at least will talk to us before they leave, hopefully. And then when we're fighting for a new client, that we can actually add something better than our opposition. Because we are in an environment now where we need to be John in the jungle and not David. We need to outrun everybody else, just so the tiger doesn't get us. Thanks very much. got a little bit of time for questions. Eight questions, two questions, or a comment or something. Don't be shy, any questions for Mark? We've got him for a couple more minutes, guys. The wealth of knowledge. We've got one here, Jennifer. Yeah, I just want to have a question. Um, you mentioned about the, um, like the pool of borrowers as an average stat and the rate rises being rapid and... Larger. I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I just can't answer it. I have no idea. Do you have a view on the wage price index versus gas price index? It's not something I've ever considered before, but it's a very good question. Um, but, and thanks, Ray. I, I don't have a view on it. And I, haven't, I ha certainly haven't seen anything written about it. 
in, in terms of correlation, uh, like arithmetic correlations, I haven't seen anything written about it anywhere. Um, it's quite possible that house price index and wage price index are correlated because the house wage price index is about people's ability to afford something. Um, I'm sure there probably is some correlation, but I've just never seen it written about, and I certainly haven't done analysis of it myself. And I see our friends here at ANZ. Hopefully, you know you're okay. You know, like uh, I want to see your response, but <laughs> big respect. <laughs> Ah, uh, hi. You are talking about uh, wages not affecting, but I was reading some insolvency reports, and at the moment, I see that a lot of companies are going into the receivership because of a labor shortage. Do you have any views for that? Yeah, well, um, in terms of insolvencies, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't read the same article, but uh, in terms of insolvencies, I mean, I guess particularly in the, in the, we get really into this, but particularly in terms of the building industry, um, it, it's a massive problem. Uh, where insolvencies are being created as not resu as a result of interest rate rises, but as a result of um, cost blowouts and uh, people not being able to control the inflation that operates within their own environment. Um, you know, it's probably it's not that bad here just yet. Where it is bad is in China. I mean, China is a whole big topic. Um, you know, we talk about prosperity of this nation and um, our reserve bank going too hard, or, or other reserve banks going too hard around the world as well. You know, the US is in recession at the moment. Our biggest issue in Australia is given that 70% of our exports go to China, China, Korea, Japan, but largely China. Um, if China implodes because of its insolvencies right now, um, then we've got a major problem. Because the insolvencies that are occurring in, the, in China, for example, are around building industry. And of course, building industry in China imports our um, iron ore, which they convert to steel. They also, to convert our iron ore to steel, they have to import our, cow, our coal. Um, so, and uh, in order to, and because what they're trying to do is build cities and drag people out of the rural areas to the cities, because the people who used to live in the rural areas used to grow their own wheat or, or, or rice or whatever it is, they're now moving in the cities and not growing stuff. They also need our proteins, which helps our wheat exports and our, our, our protein exports, meat and wheat and everything else. Um, so if China has a growth problem, let's t take the geopolitical stuff out, just a growth problem, then they stop importing our stuff. Then we, have a, then we have a prosperity problem, a growth problem, which could be a double whammy to us during these interest rate periods. So inflation won't become the problem for us. It'll be our export industry will become a problem for us. And the thing that's been carrying Australia's GDP has been our exports minus imports, our exports, because they've been exporting at extraordinarily high rates and a far more productive rate than we've ever done in the past because during the GFC, our big miners, they put all new infrastructure in and massive amounts of capacity. So we've got huge capacity now. And of course, places like Brazil and all that have gone and imploded. There's problems there in terms of, they've got lots of resources, but they, they're unreliable. So I think that um, in terms of liquidations or bankruptcies or insolvencies, our biggest issue will be what happens in China down the track. So irrespective of chest beating and whether or not they are a threat to Taiwan and all that geopolitical stuff. I think, and I'm not here to make a political statement, but I just think that what Albanese's approach is, is far better for us economically than the previous approach or the current opposition approach because we need to protect our growth and prosperity, number one. And the Reserve Bank is very mindful of that. I, I mean, I've had discussions with various people that they're very mindful of what's going on in China. China won't do it to punish us. China just could actually have a major problem. I mean, I, I guess everybody here knows what happens there. You, know, you buy a property in China, you buy it off the plan. You don't wait until the building's built to complete the, the purchase. You complete the purchase before the building's even started. You borrow all the money, or most of the money, from a bank in China, and you give it to the developer. But then if the developer's got a problem with inflation, in other words, can't develop it at the price that they originally thought they're gonna develop it at, then they can get into serious bankruptcy problems themselves with their own banks, which is actually what's happened in China. And these building sites just stop. But you, the borrow buyer and borrower, are still paying interest. So what's happening is the borrowers and the buyers are saying, we're not gonna pay interest anymore. We're not paying, because these dudes aren't gonna build the building. 
and everything stopped. So it's a problem with the banking system there. It will create a problem with the banking system there, which is always a drama in terms of ratings, etc. But it's a, it's a major problem with developers going broke who actually borrowed hundreds of billions of dollars from the Chinese government or Chinese banks. So China's really facing a massive threat. And then add to that the COVID, zero COVID tolerance, whatever it is, is that they want zero COVID. So they just lock joints down and no business occurs. That's our biggest trading partner by far. And our GDP has been propped up, not by household consumption, but it's been propped up by our, the difference between exports and imports. And you, you saw BHP put out a record profit yesterday. Um, question in their mind would always be, and everybody else for that matter, who exports, what does the future hold? Because we're, they're making the money out of China, not out of America or anywhere else, out of China. So our biggest issue, we should pay really close attention to what's happening in China, both geopolitically, but also just what's going on in the joint. Again, another conversation you can have with your clients. Mark, one final question. Thanks very much, Mark. I really appreciated your, uh, your insights there, particularly around net zero and just the explanation that you gave around that. Um, I've long been of the, of the view that um, interest rates will only get to about 2.5%, 2.75% wholesale rates. Um, but uh, we're a long way from net zero if inflation's around 6 or 8%. Um, one thing is that um, inflation is now going to be recorded monthly instead of quarterly, which is yep. going to have a positive impact in terms of the, the accuracy of the information. But um, the two biggest drivers of inflation, to my mind, are uh, fuel prices um, and uh, reserve, uh, reserve bank interest rates could in fact be a driver to inflation if they're not sort of kept under control. So supply chain, fuel and, um, uh, and the reserve bank rates. Given all of that um, and that uh, fuel the, the fuel crisis is, or the fuel um, uh, price is going to come down with OPEC producing more. Supply chain will kind of sort itself out, and, um, uh, and the Ukraine was was not in, couldn't have been anticipated. How fast do you think inflation is actually going to come down um, to stop that pressure on interest rates going up? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. And it's uh, but the res I can I I think it, this is actually an opportunity to actually pivot to a good point. When a client asks you that, mm. or if you're having a conversation with a client, like you've just had with me, yeah. I always say, look, my opinion doesn't count. I will go back to what the Reserve Bank said in their last statement. And the Reserve Bank said in their last statement that they expect inflation in 2023 to be at 4%. Right. And that they expect inflation in 2024 to be back down to the two to 3% range. Yeah. They also have said they expect inflation to towards the end of this year to be around 7.75%, yeah. as has the Treasurer recently. Yeah. So it's the reason why I always go back to the Reserve Bank, because if I don't know the answer, I'm better off quoting the most authoritative um, body in the country on what the position will be. Because I don't know and I don't think anybody knows. I agree with you. And therefore, I guess this is a good example of how we talk to clients. Hmm. Um, if a client puts you on the spot, you don't have to give them an answer because you don't know. I don't know. Chris Joy doesn't know. I mean, he might have some modelling, but he doesn't know. Probably the Reserve Bank doesn't know, but they are no. the most authority body for us. And that is what they've said. 4% yeah. in 2023. Hmm. Now, they haven't said which month, but clearly they're not talking about January or February. It's sometime during 2023. And back to 2 to 3% towards in the in 2024 yep. which by the way is interesting they said before interest rates won't start going up until 2024 uh, and if that's only november october last year but yeah. but, but so I, I think that's probably the best way for me to answer it because i don't know the answer to you to your point no, i don't good think answer. Right, i don't you. think reserve bank but it's a good example of how we would talk to our customers all right thank you very much for that. thank you